Henry Hyde, second Earl of Clarendon, was Lord of the Manors of Christchurch and West Stour, or Westover, which extended from Keyhaven in the east as far as the county boundary at Black Rock near Allanchine in the west, including Stourfield Heath, which would later become the town of Bournemouth. Desperately short of cash, in 1697, Clarendon began a process of asset stripping, which included the sale of all of the most valuable agricultural land in the district. The sale agreements stipulated that the common rights attached to these land holdings would thereafter exclude 25 acres of moory or boggy ground, commonly known as Bourne Bottom. In other words, this was a new enclosure where tenants of the manor could previously have grazed cattle or collected turf for fueling their household fires. The only significant landholding Clarendon retained was Holdenhurst Farm. The purpose of this enclosure is revealed by the note of a 99-year lease dated 25th of March 1697, which before the calendar changed 55 years later, was New Year's Day. Clarendon and his son, Lord Cornbury, granted this land to a group of seven men to make a duck hoy in return for a shilling a year plus a seventh of the annual profits. Thomas Apprice, Richard Ewer and Charles Hackman had all been burgesses of Christchurch since at least 1690, drafted in from outside the borough by Clarendon to shore up support for his choice of parliamentary candidate. Apprice was a member of Clarendon's household and held a salaried post for doing nothing as a customs officer in the Port of London. Ewer was apparently one of Clarendon's tenants at Clarendon Park near Salisbury, but also the tenant of Holdenhurst Farm. Hackman was a little more local, based in Lymington, though he bought at this time part of Clarendon's estate at Burton, just north of Christchurch. Matthew Best and William Ayres were probably locals and the most likely to have had a hand in setting up and managing what was in fact a decoy pond, a device for trapping birds that would be sold for meat. We know the precise location and extent of the decoy pond premises from a map drawn in 1805 when the rest of Stairfield Heath was enclosed. Note the internal divisions within the premises which appear to have resulted from the cutting of drainage ditches in the boggy ground. Channeling water into a single stream would have facilitated crossing the valley bottom and may have led to the introduction of the Bourne Plank first noted in 1743. Now North is at the bottom of this map, so let's spin it round so that it looks a little more familiar. And see how it overlies a modern map, extending from the pavilion in the southeast to beyond the Wessex Way in the northwest. We can then drop in the latest LiDAR data, which shows us the present day ground elevation the decoy pond premises very clearly follow the lowest lying land. To see the original 25 acre premises, we can remove the 15 acre extension that was granted to Horatio Nelson's brother-in-law, George Matcham, shown here, when he took a lease in 1796 from Clarendon's successor as Lord of the Manor, Sir George Iverson Tapps, who is the direct ancestor of the present-day Merrick family. George Matcham, who owned the property now bearing his name near Ringwood, took over at Bourne a house which was falling down, its upper floor and ceilings dropping to pieces. This was no doubt the house that had appeared on maps as early as 1714. Matcham requested permission to build an extension to the house so that his children might begin sea bathing towards the end of February, and later decided that he would rather build a new cottage near the sea at the southern end of the enclosure. He suggested, again in 1796, that Sir George Tapps should build an inn, convinced that it would be full four months in a year for the purpose of bathing and enjoying the sea air. Tapps' steward believed that Matcham intended to extend the premises toward the seashore, 
that there might be room for erecting other cottages and thereby obtain a neighbourhood. Indeed, Matcham wrote that he would immediately begin his cottage if he were certain of a neighbour. In the 1760s, Robert Stupart had been able to do a deal with the Stourfield Heath commoners in order to enclose two large fields at his property near Pokesdown, to the east of Bourne. And in the 1780s, Edmund Bott wined and dined the commoners who signed their agreement for further enclosures when Bott had finished building Stourfield House. But by 1796, when Matcham wanted to extend his property at Bourne, resistance to enclosure was growing nationally. It is very clear from the correspondence between Sir George Tapps and his steward that they believed it would have been impossible to obtain the consent of the commoners for further enclosures at Bourne. The correspondence also reveals that Sir George's desire to build holiday homes there was a major factor in his driving forward the parliamentary enclosure that was finalised in 1805. Even Lewis Tregonwell, mistakenly identified as the founder of Bournemouth, referred in 1811 to Sir George Tapps's colony at Bourne. The decoy pond at Bourne was not the only one in the area. There was another not far away near Sopley, which had characteristic pipes into which unsuspecting birds were driven. George Matcham was obviously more interested in freezing his children than in catching ducks, and so it's unsurprising that the pond mapped for the first time in 1805 had lost any pipes that it had once had. In fact, it had fallen into disuse before 1789. Here, I have outlined to scale some decoy ponds in other parts of England. Of course, it is possible that the original decoy pond at Bourne was within the enclosure south of the plank, but there's no conspicuous purpose or evidence of any financial outlay for filling it in or for digging a new pond in the north part of the enclosure. Constrained by the bounds of the premises, the pond at Bourne could never have been particularly large, and you have to wonder if it was ever any use for catching birds. The Customs Service had for many years been trying to restrict the shipping and landing of goods to recognised places where they could be inspected and taxed. This survey of the Port of Poole in 1565 specifically recommended Bournemouth as a place where lading and unlading should be discontinued, and by 1592, regulations saw to it that even the alum and copperas produced at Boscombe and Alum Chine, shown here on John Speed's map of 1611, had to be carried overland to Poole before it could be shipped around the coast. This early chemical industry thrived for about 40 years, despite complaints that the factories were consuming vast quantities of turf and may have led to minor improvements to the road from Christchurch through Boscombe to Poole as it passed through Bourne Bottom. This map of about 1627 shows the road continuing past the factory at Alum Chine. By 1680, it was already being reported that merchants and tradesmen had got together and at great expense made wagonways for the carriage of the vast quantities of French goods which had been landed illegally between Poole and Lymington. The first whiff of something not quite right at the Bourne decoy premises came in 1702, when having had frequent reports of goods being landed specifically at Bourne Bottom, not Bourne Mouth, the Customs Commissioners appointed George Saville to reside there as a preventive officer. His annual salary of £50 was to be taken out of the sale of the goods that he would seize, and he was to keep a horse to enable him to patrol the area. Ten years later, it was reported that the district was very notorious for smuggling, and Saville's job description was upgraded to that of a waiter and searcher, extending his powers for apprehending smugglers. Now, Charles Hackman, one of the original proprietors of the Bourne decoy, 
was quite cosy with the customs officers at Lymington, one of whom, Hugh Harsnett, was responsible for overseeing the riding officers, including Saville. In March 1718, Harsnett proposed to the customs commissioners in London that Saville should be stationed not at Bourne Bottom, but rather at Muscliffe or Throop. Saville promptly disappeared from duty, asking permission to remain on leave in London. Only then did the senior officers at Poole and Southampton reject Harsnett's proposal, saying that we are apt to believe that this proposal from the said Mr. Harsnett tends more to some private advantage than the public service of the Crown. Saville was suspended in July, but within a year he was an officer in the Port of London, perhaps through the influence of Hackman's business partner, Thomas Apprice. While Saville was conveniently out of the way on leave, some barrels of claret, white wine and brandy turned up, floating in the sea off Bournemouth and attached to an iron grapple. Sir Peter Mews had bought the manor of Westover from Clarendon and with it the right to wreck and the admiralty jurisdiction which gave him the authority to determine that these barrels and their contents belonged to him. Of course, he was also now landlord of the Bourne decoy. Clarendon and Mews were both at times under suspicion of Jacobitism, wishing to restore the Stuart royal dynasty, a cause which is known to have received financial support through supplying smugglers and receiving profits from their sales. Let's have a closer look at the map which we saw at the start of this presentation. It seems to have been drawn sometime between about 1720 and 1750 to record the western boundary of the manor of West Star, marked here by posts driven into small pits. A British merchant vessel, apparently heading towards Poole, is within sight of what appears to be one of the customs sloops that operated here at around that time, flying a pennant without an ensign. Oddly, in this image of orderly trading, the only features that appear regularly in customs correspondence, Bourne Bottom and the decoy premises, are not marked. The original Bourne Decoy Partnership, still operating in 1719, had been dissolved sometime before 1740 when the premises were leased to William Harris, whose family held them for the next 55 years. In 1749, Harris's annual rent was paid by his wife, probably because Harris himself was in Winchester jail, charged with unshipping large quantities of illicit brandy and rum. He was finally released on bail in 1751 after informing on his accomplices, including Thomas Lush, a butcher from Wimborne. Harris then took employment on board one of the customs boats engaged in the prevention of smuggling, but pleading illness, he was put ashore after a short while, though he continued to receive 10 shillings a week from the customs commissioners. He was probably back in residence in the house at Bourne Bottom in 1762, when Joseph Manuel, himself suspected of informing on smugglers, was kidnapped and severely beaten there before being transported to the Channel Islands. Harris's son, also William, like his father, was also charged with smuggling and joined a customs boat after giving information, but in 1774 settled in the house at Bourne Bottom with his family of three young children. The premises were later taken over by his brother-in-law, Edward Beak. No, not that kind of Beak, who enjoyed outward respectability as a yeoman farmer just across the county boundary at Ensbury. The customs records, however, show that he was a notorious smuggler, repeatedly indicted by customs officers who claimed that his wagons were used to carry goods up from the beaches of Westover, but perhaps because of his violent nature he was never shopped by his accomplices and escaped a threatened fine of £13,000. These men are often romanticised in accounts of smuggling, but we shouldn't forget that many of them grew rich from vicious criminal activity. Local customs officers frequently suffered beatings from men armed with lead-weighted sticks and horsewhips. John Bursey, 
a riding officer based to the east of Christchurch, was murdered by smugglers in 1780, leaving a widow and four children. In a battle with customs officers at Bournemouth in 1784, one of the smugglers was killed and others wounded on the beach. One of the customs officers was shot in the arm and had to retire from service. Two months later, William Allen, the master of a customs vessel, was killed in another battle at Mulliford near Christchurch Harbour. Edward Beak was evidently too busy to keep the Bourne decoy operating. A survey taken in 1789 recorded him still as the tenant, but the dwelling house, school house, stable and garden, together with 25 acres, five of which were converted to arable, were now, according to the description, formerly a decoy pond. And seven years later, George Matcham moved in with his freezing children. Matcham, in fact, only stayed a year before assigning his lease to Philip Norris, who had just bought the small estate at Boscombe that had been sold off by Clarendon a century earlier, perhaps a remnant of the Tudor chemical works. Matcham was probably annoyed that Norris had managed to get the commoner's permission to enclose an additional half acre at Boscombe. Edmund Bott had already planted pines to provide wind protection for his house at Starfield, simultaneously answering a call for more timber for Navy ships, although he found that rabbits would eat as many as three quarters of all the new saplings. Norris planted them at Boscombe, despite the discouragement from Sir George Tapps's steward, who considered that he may as well attempt to raise timber on the Dome of St Paul's. After the 1805 enclosure, Tapps would eventually start a pine plantation himself at Bourne Bottom when the Tapps Arms public house, coach house and stable were under construction, the first steps towards what would be referred to in 1810 as his new city. But that's another story. <laughs> 